Assalamu alaikum dear participants we begin our Islam study circle for today uh, the Quranic verse that we are going to study is uh, being displayed before you it's uh, verse 90 of surah 16 which is surah nahl it says in the laha ya'muru bil adl wal ihsan wa ita izil qurba wa yanha anil fahsha'i wal munkar wal baghy ya'izukum la'allakum tazakkarun God directs you to be just and kind and to give the near ones and to give to the near ones and forbids vulgarity, vices and rebelliousness. He counsels you so that you may become hateful. So as you can see, uh, if you reflect on this verse that it tells us and guides us regarding some of the three fundamental do's and don'ts regarding religion. And as far as the three do's are concerned, they are spelled out foremost. And on the top is Adil, is justice. Uh, justice is the supreme value which we must uphold at all times. We have to be just to even our enemies. We have to be just to our rivals and opponents. We have to just be just to our, our everyone around us and justice should be dispensed regardless of the consequences. Whether people who know us, they get uh, angered by us, maybe even our parents, our siblings, our children, they might get angry if we speak the truth, if we speak what justice is. Even then, we must uphold justice. Justice is actually a representation of the Almighty Himself on earth. The greatest just being on in the universe is God Himself. And hence, we have to dispense with justice as much as we can. And in this regard, there must be no discrimination at all, not only in our private affairs, but also in the level or in the, on the status that in which we administer affairs of the state. This justice has to be given to all people they must have equal opportunity to justice. And this is not just legal justice that we're talking about. It's justice in every sphere of life. This includes social justice. It includes economic justice. So the word justice or being just is a state which has to be upheld in every department of our life, in every sphere of our life. And you can see that when the Quran has spelled out the three do's, the top slot is occupied by justice. And then comes Ihsan. Ihsan means that you have to be more than just. You are, you are favorable to the other person by being more than just, by perhaps doing something better to him. Like for example, giving him a grace period if he has borrowed from you. Although you could have not given this grace period, but you take a step ahead. So it's like showing further courtesy, further regard, further compassion. It's a step ahead to justice. And when a person goes a step ahead to justice, one can clearly see how he or she can become a righteous human being. This really means that that person has regard for humanity, has general compassion, kindness, sympathy for people around him or her. So the second thing which is uh, actually uh, outlined here is Ihsan. And as I said, Ihsan here means to be kind, to be, to take a step ahead of justice, something you might know, something you might have the right to, but you at times forgo your right. At times you forgive the other person, even if you think that uh, there could have been a possibility of exacting revenge from him or her. So by forgiving a person for something bad he has done, although we had this uh, opportunity and the option to take equal revenge from that person but still we choose to forgive a person this can be this has to be counted in ihsan or as i said it's a step ahead to justice so the third thing which is mentioned here is wa ita izil qurba to give to the near ones and for those of us who might not realize the importance of how the quran stresses that we have to spend as much as we can on on people around us on people who especially are related to us, who are our kin. 
and as much as we can and don't forget that this kin or this kinship included in this kinship is our parents they are uh, included in this we have to spend on our parents we have to spend on our spouses we have to spend on our children we have to spend on those near and dear to us and it's not just spending which is uh, outlined here it is whatever we can give them at times it could be good advice at times it could be perhaps uh, even your own time and and uh, providing them with the opportunity to share with you what they have to tell you so it's like being compassionate to your kin to your own relatives and this of course is something that we must all uh, uphold in our lives we must be a shelter to people we must be a safe heaven to people we must provide that uh, shoulder to a person on which he or she can sob and uh, share the the woes and the griefs that uh, she or he may be passing so this is a big virtue which is uh, spelled out here and as i said that these three do's of the quran justice being a step ahead in justice and administering ihsan and then uh, spending and giving to our near of kin they are they are actually highlighted by the quran as a three supreme uh virtues acts of virtues uh in a person's life and on the same by the same token we have three things from which we have been forbidden the first of them is fahsha which means acts of vulgarity like for example extra marital relations like for example displaying our private parts in a manner that it becomes uh, extremely uh, indecent so all these uh, acts of lewdity all these acts of licentiousness and vulgarity they have to be forbidden and why because you see religion ra- lays its stress on the system and ins- institution of family and when whenever there is this this display of vulgarity in a family or in a society it dents the institution of family because then what happens is that one's sexual urges and inclinations they are not they are not specified or they they do not remain specific for one spouse they actually go out of bounds they cross the limits and instead of uh, eliciting pleasure and spiritual satisfaction and physical satisfaction from one spouse one looks to other people and this of course dents the family very badly and instead of uh, concentrating on those fa- family lines uh people then look out of their family look out and fantasize which of course is something which really has a very bad effect on our family a good family is a family in which the spouses are devoted to one another a good family is a family in which they are true friends of one another and if possible they become soulmates of one another they are if a good family is a family in which the husband and the wife they form a uh, beautiful whole they form a beautiful unified whole and they are also a means of uh, rearing and nourishing a family in which they are able to inculcate basic human values so this all this is essential it might be thought of as something of a far stretch or a far fetched affair but it is not to inculcate all these values you have to have a strong family setup and in order to have a strong family setup any form of vulgarity any form of lewdity uh, has to be uh, avoided because it does not uh, augur well for the family setup and then the second thing which is mentioned among the don'ts is wal munkar all the vices everything which is understood to be wrong by our own human nature they must it must be avoided like for example telling lies or being corrupt or embezzling funds or being dishonest being unjust all these vices which as human beings every one of us detests uh, should never be as, uh, resorted to and if a society is sensitive towards these vices one can clearly see how one can really prosper not only in the physical realm but also in the spiritual realm if these uh, evils they are checked in our society if they are at least uh, uh, taken care of and noticed by people who can have an effect on them and people are properly instructed because you see the likeness for virtue is found in our own selves and the hate for 
evil things for bad things is also found in our own nature. It's just a question of urging our nature, of coming forward and disregarding these things. And the third thing which is mentioned is walbaghi, which means rebelliousness, which means that you, uh, you turn against the law of God, you turn against the law of the society. You not only turn against it, but you, take, you create a law and order situation. You create this uh, atmosphere in which you openly challenge the norms and the laws of a society. And of course, uh, this would mean that the society and the family in which we live in, they might get disrupted. They might get ruined from, its, from their very basis. And in this way, the fabric of the society is totally shaken. So the three do's and the three don'ts, these are spelled out very, very uh, beautifully in this world. Justice, goodness, spending on the kin, giving to the kin. These are the three do's and the three don'ts are to refrain from vulgarity, from vices and from rebelliousness. And the verse ends by saying, يَعِذُكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ That God counsels you that you may become heedful. That the Almighty actually gives us this uh, advice by adopting these three things and by, from refraining from these three things so that we are able to succeed in our lives. So uh, with these words, uh, viewers, we now uh, go on to the next uh, segment of our uh, study circle, which is uh, Hadith of the day. And uh, the Hadith that we are going to study is taken from the al Jamiya Sahih of Imam Muslim. Its words are, uh, it's reported by a reputed companion of the Prophet Abdullah bin Masood. It says, An Abdullah bin Masood and an Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam qal, La yadkhulu al-jannata man kana fi qalbihi mithqalu azarratin min kibr. Qala rajulun, inna rajula yuhibbu an yakuna sawbuhu hasana wa na'aluhu hasana. Qal, inna allaha jameel wa yuhibbu al-jamal. Al-kibr, batrul haq wa ghamtun nas. So these are sublime words which really come out of the mouths of the prophets of God and they really uh, touch our hearts. So Abdullah bin Masood reports that the Prophet said, A person in whose hearts is the slightest trace of arrogance will not enter paradise. A person asked, A person likes that his clothes be nice and his shoes also be nice. Is this not arrogance? The Prophet replied, God is beautiful and likes what is beautiful. Arrogance actually means denying the truth and regarding people to be inferior. So one can see how beautifully the Prophet has uh, narrated and stated the true meaning of arrogance. And he has vehemently denied the fact that if you wear good clothes, or if, you, if you wear good apparel, good shoes, don't think that this, is, this should be counted as something of an arrogance, of an arrogant behavior or haughtiness or the fact that you are showing off. No. Uh, the answer which is given by the Prophet is that God himself is beautiful and he likes what, is, what beauty is. So this aesthetic sense that he has blessed us with is something which comes to us naturally. If we dress up good, it does not show that we are arrogant at all. And then the Prophet has actually interjected and said that what actually constitutes arrogance is two things. One of them is batrul haq, which means denying the truth even when it is apparent to us, when we know what the truth is, when we know what justice is, what the truth is, and even then we deliberately deny, we purposefully deny that particular truth, then that constitutes arrogance. And the second thing which the Prophet has said is ghamatun nas, which means regarding people to be inferior. We regard ourselves to be superior and we regard people to be inferior. This is what arrogance is. So arrogance is not wearing good clothes. Arrogance is not uh, being a, a person who would like to uh, wear good clothes. But arrogance actually means that we have disregard for people. We think that they are inferior to us. And we also deny the truth which comes to us. And this truth can come to us from any person. It could be someone whom we like. It could be someone who is perhaps our adversary, who was our rival. But if it is the truth... And whatever is the truth, we are expected to rise to the occasion. We are expected to accept the truth. And if we deny the truth, and remember, this is actually a big, big punishment which is mentioned in the Quran. People often ask that why is it that the Quran has shown harshness in some of its verses. And it really has something very bad to say about people. 
at certain instances. So if you reflect on the Quran on all such instances, you'll find that the people in question for which the Almighty is showing extreme anger are the people who are arrogant, who are haughty, who think themselves to be superior to others, who intentionally deny the truth. And in fact, uh, the people of the times of the Prophet, the, the, the people of the book and the idolaters, the polytheists, uh, they were guilty of intentionally denying the truth. They, they, they absolutely were certain that the Prophet who has come to them is a true Prophet. They were waiting for such a Prophet, especially the people of the book. But when he came to them, in spite of recognizing them, out of sheer arrogance, uh, they denied him. And this actually evoked the wrath of God. So you have to realize that arrogance is such a thing that it really angers the Almighty. And I, I should say that even all of us as human beings, we never like people who are arrogant. Uh, we have a very bad feeling for a person who shows arrogance, who, who elevates himself and doesn't think that he is a, he's a human being. And it is here that the Almighty has said that such people, if they do so, then they are guilty of arrogance. Wearing good clothes or new clothes or shoes or dressing up should not be counted as arrogance at all. Now, let us come to the third part of our study circle views. And this is the Bible verse of the day. And the Bible verse of the day, which I have selected, is uh, to just to inform you how, in fact, the Bible is perhaps, or let me just elaborate, when I say the Bible, I refer not only to, I, I, I specifically refer to the Old Testament and to the New Testament uh, and to the Psalms of David, which were the three preceding books or the first three books of Islam. So instead of thinking that they are books of uh, Jews or Christians or the followers of David, no, that's not the correct presentation. We will say that there are four books, four known books at the moment. Of course, there were other books as well, which were lost to posterity. But there are four books that have survived. All of them are books of Islam because the religion which was revealed to all the prophets of God was Islam, the same religion. And hence, I would say that the Old Testament, as it survives today, is the first book of Islam. And the Psalms of David is the second surviving book of Islam. And similarly, the New Testament of Jesus is the third surviving book of Islam and the Quran is the fourth and final book of Islam. So this is the presentation that we need to make and we need to understand. And if we make this presentation, we can clearly see that we must start off by studying the first, second and third books of Islam as well. It's not just that the Quran is to be studied. Each and every divine scripture must be studied because it's equally the revelation of the Almighty. And here I do make a case for you, uh, dear viewers, to see that how Surah Fatiha, which is so fundamental to our uh, prayer and to our life, that every single child born is taught this Surah because he or she has to read it in every rakat of the prayer and everyone knows it by heart. And you can see how this same Surah Fatiha, although in different words, is found in the Old Testament, it is found in the Psalms of David, and it is also found in the New Testament. And uh, of course, there are the words were different slightly, but the, the, the subject matter is so similar that one can clearly spot uh, these surahs the way they are mentioned in the previous scriptures. So uh, if I just uh, read out to you from the Old Testament, of course, these quotations are extensive, but I'll just pick and choose. Uh, the book of Leviticus, uh, chapter number 19 and verse 18, it says, Do not make attempts to get equal with one who has done you wrong, or keep hard feelings against the children of your people, but have love for your neighbor as for yourself. Remember, this is how uh, loving thy neighbor as thyself, as mentioned in one of the commands of the New Testament, how it is actually reflected even in the Old Testament. And then we have the book of Exodus, uh, chapter 34, verses 6 and 7 says, The Lord, the Lord, a God full of pity and grace, showed, slow to wrath and great in mercy and faith. Uh, Alhamdulillah, is preceded by the words, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, and see how they match God full of pity and grace, slow to wrath and great in mercy and faith, having mercy on thousands, overlooking evil and wrongdoing and sin. He will not let wrongdoers go free. He will not let wrongdoers go free, 
but will send punishment on children for the sins of their fathers and on their children's children to the third and fourth generation. Of course, this is a special, this has a special context in which the children of uh, Israel or the Israelites, they had to face a special law of the Almighty in which because they were the progeny of the prophets of God and were actually instituted as witness of truth unto mankind on this earth, they had a special law to reckon with and this not be confused with the general law as well. So you can see how closely these words resemble uh, the Surah Fatiha that we study today in, our, uh, in the Quran. And then let me also, uh, I'm going to skip the uh, slightly longer Surah Fatiha or the way I would see it as a Surah Fatiha from the book of Psalms. You can, you can just skim through it. Psalms 86, by the way, is one, verse 1 to 17 as a longer uh, selection. But uh, if you have the time, then do go through the Psalms and especially the 86th Psalm and the first 17 verses. Now I come to the Surah Fatiha, which is so famous uh, in the New Testament. And uh, every single person who believes in Jesus has this in his mind, in his heart, just as uh, other people like those who believe in the Prophet Muhammad have the Surah Fatiha in their hearts and minds. So it says, Our Father in Heaven, remember the word Father is mentioned in the Bible as a figurative use for, for God Almighty Himself. So, Our Father in Heaven, may your name be kept holy. Let your kingdom come. Let your pleasure be done as in heaven, so on earth. Give us this day uh, the bread for our needs. And make us free of our debts, as we have made those free who are in debt to us. And let us not be put to the test, but keep us safe and from the evil one. So you can see how uh, this, as this, these words from the New Testament, this is actually the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 6, verses 9 to 13, who spell out this particular, uh, uh, these particular words and how beautifully they encompass the Surah Fatiha of the Injil. And uh, this is just a case in point to make. Otherwise, if you study the Old and the New Testament and the Psalms, you will find so much similarity that uh, our hearts will just speak this, this speak out to us that all these three have the same source. All these three spring from the same source of the Almighty. The Quran is the final testament. It's not the first book of Islam. It is the final book of Islam. And if we treat the Quran to be the final book of Islam, we can clearly see how it can affect our psyche vis-a-vis -vis our, our, our other brethren, for example, whom we call as uh, non-Muslims. They too are Muslims, but I would say that they are Muslims who have lost some of the teachings. They are still Muslims, but they have lost some of the teachings of the prophets and hence they have to re take recourse to the final testament. Uh, viewers, I'm making a slight change in the program and uh, instead of uh, giving us some break uh, uh, and uh, looking towards the uh, next uh, uh, next part of our topic, I, I would suggest that if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hands and I'll unmute your mic and uh, after that we'll go on to the second part of our uh, study session. So I see uh, Ms. Rafia Khwaja, uh, your hand is raised. I'm just going to unmute your mic. Kindly unmute your mic, it's self mute now. It's, it's okay now. Please go ahead with your question. In the New Testament, didn't St. Paul change things? And so, what we see, what we call Christianity today, is different from the Old Testament? That is one question of mine. If you don't mind, I'll also tell you the second question. Now that Ramzan is coming and Zakat has to be paid, I have a stock shares and I find that the government cuts 15% tax on every dividend of mine. So in the end, my Zakat, what I have calculated has to be paid, is less than the tax. But, but I want to pay Zakat to whoever I feel like. So how do I solve this problem? Because the government is not giving me the chance to do this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So the answer to your first question is that we have to make this distinction that there is one thing which is called the Bible, which consists of Bible history and the Old and the New Testaments and 
the letters of St. Paul in which uh, he has uh, allegedly changed certain precepts of uh, the religion revealed to Jesus. And uh, then there is one thing as, God, as the New Testament itself. So if you look at Bible history, you'll see that it has been uh, written in a way that there have been interpolations and additions and deletions. But as far as the New Testament and Old Testament are concerned, to the best of my ability, I have yet to find anything which is different from the Quran. Every single thing is actually from the Quran. As far as St. Paul is concerned, he made, uh, made a step ahead uh, and he actually revoked the Sharia, the revoked law uh, from the Bible and said that it is not meant for us who believe in, in Jesus. Uh, uh, and uh, this is what they said and this is the step he, uh, he took and hence uh, since he's being followed the most uh, in uh, the Pauline Christianity I would say is the one which is being followed the most in the world so people actually think that the Sharia has been revoked and if they believe that Jesus died on the cross for the sins of mankind and that is sufficient for their own uh, salvation this is what St. Paul has taught but what I'm talking of is the New or the Old Testament themselves it's like saying that whatever Paul, St. Paul has taught is something of, a, of an ishtahad maybe or whatever he thought was right. But as far as the books of God are concerned, they are still intact. The only thing is that they are, the previous testaments have not, are not preserved in their original language. The Quran or the final testament is, is preserved in the original language. But the previous scriptures, their lang they are basically translations of the original but they are uh, still intact and uh, we can see them how they can uh, they reflect the teachings of the Almighty. And we also should know that, uh, for example, in the case of the New Testament, uh, the language of Jesus was Syriac, but the first New Testament or the first gospel was written, as it is said, 70 years up, uh, or 70 AD in Greek and it was never written in Syriac. So we can see how the connection is between that we don't have the original language. But as I said, uh, whatever Paul has said and whatever Pauline Christianity uh, represents is one thing. And what the Bible is or the New Testament is, it is simply another thing. What Paul has done is he's just said that we need, we need not follow the precepts of the law. Uh, and believing in Jesus that he sacrificed himself on the cross for the sins of mankind is sufficient. But this is not what the New Testament says at all. And uh, so therefore... Paul says that Jesus is the son of uh, God. Right. Isn't that the biggest difference and the biggest problem? You see, what I'm saying is that there's one thing as the Christian beliefs and there's another thing called New Testament. It's just like saying that there are a lot of things which Muslims believe and they're not found in the Quran. So how, how would you explain that a person who is a Muslim, he's still prostrating before graves and asking uh, for that person buried in the grave to grant his wish, uh, isn't that uh, something which is an equally detestable practice? So you need to realize that one thing is the scripture and the other thing is what Christians or Muslims are actually following. And uh, what they are following not, might not necessarily be a reflection of what the scripture contains. So my request to all of you would be to go through the New Testament and see and find out where exactly does Jesus this being called the Son of God. Remember, in divine languages, in Hebrew and in Syriac, the word son is also spoken for servant or abd. Abd means a person devoted to God. And it, in, in many places where this expression is used, the Son of God, it actually refers to the servant of God or the person who worships God and is obedient to God. And this is how uh, this, this translation has actually been misrepresented. So uh, we need to make this distinction that one is what Christians believe and another thing is what the Bible actually says, just as one is what Muslims do and another thing is what the Quran says. And uh, as far as your second question is concerned regarding uh, paying zakat, uh, of course when the government takes zakat you are left with no option to, to pay, but of course you can still uh, go ahead and spending in charity even if your zakat has been deducted, is a noble thing. And if you can afford to spare more money, so think that you are being uh, provided with an opportunity to spend in the way of God by just using your money, whatever you have, and it will be over and above your zakat and it will be counted as a, as a, as a sadaqah, as a, as a amount in charity, which will earn great reward for you. But if you are not able to do this, we do hope that you'll 
still get the reward of your intention. But of course, as you said, and I, I mean, understand that once the, the government deducts taxes or zakat, then uh, we are not left with this opportunity because we do expect that that money which has been deducted by the government will return to the public, will return to the people who are needy and to the people that whom we want to spend to. But as I said, if you are not given this opportunity, then your obligation is fulfilled because you have paid your zakat, but you still have the opportunity to spend more and earn reward from the Almighty. So, uh, viewers, let's uh, move on to the next part of our uh, study segment. And uh, this, uh, uh, this time, uh, we're going to uh, perhaps talk about a very important uh, aspect of our lives, uh, which we come across every day. And that is how can we exercise self-control and patience. Now, you can clearly see that as uh, human beings, there are so many instances in which we have to control ourselves. We have to be patient. We have to be steadfast. We have to believe that there is something good hidden for us, although we might not be perhaps realizing at that instant. So patience and self-control, they are the key to a, to a human life, to, to a life that all of us uh, cherish to lead, a life in which we resign ourselves to the will of God while at the same time not giving up on the efforts that we need to make. So when we say that we give up to the will of God, it does not mean that we are helpless. It only means that we do our best and leave the rest to God. So that is what the true meaning of patience is, that never give up, but don't get frustrated at the results. Because the results, in our, is, they are not in our hands. Effort, of course, is in our hands. We can do what we like, but we also know that what we do is something what we plan and what comes as a consequence, is something what God plans. So there is this planning of God and then there is this planning of our own selves. At times they are in harmony and at times they conflict with one another. And if they conflict with one another, do understand that God is having his own plans and something good is coming our way. So the first way to acquire patience is to trust God that he is a merciful creator. He will never, ever, and unless of course uh, he has to punish us for certain misdeeds of our own selves. But other than that, whatever he does, whatever fate he decides is something in which there is some good hidden for us. And we might not realize it at that time. And But if we do you know, show patience, then on hindsight, in hindsight, when we look back, we often see that what had happened earlier on was for the better, was for the good. And uh, the biggest example of this perhaps is mentioned in the Quran when you study the episode of Moses and Khizr mentioned in Surah Kahf, in which uh, Khizr, uh, angel of God, has did something which Moses never understood on three occasions. And each time he questioned him, and each time Khizr replied that, in sabra, that you'll not be able to show the same patience with me because I will be doing something which you would not be able to contain yourself to question. Like, for example, he killed a child, or for example, he damaged a boat. And in the apparent form of things, it looked a great act of injustice. But when he actually revealed the wisdom behind it, Moses had nothing to say. He was he was deeply moved and said, okay, if this is the wisdom behind the apparent acts of injustice, then of course we have to trust the Almighty. So the biggest way to acquire patience is to trust the Almighty that whatever he is doing or whatever is happening is happening from his from, out of his will. And this does not mean that we have to give up, but it only means that we have to do what is best, what we think is best. And if the result is not in congruence to what we think, then we must resign and submit to the will of God because it means that there's something uh, bigger and better for us that uh, will come uh, one day. And then the second thing, of course, which uh, gives us patience, my dear uh, viewers, is something that we are just about to uh, experience in the form of the month of Ramadan. And one of the greatest rituals of Ramadan, of, of, uh, of uh, religion, is fasting. And fasting is something which really instills patience. It really provides us with patience. It really gives us the patience that we all of our need. Because when we abstain from our physical needs, uh, it gives us the, the, the power and the strength that we have in our own cells. But it needs to come out. 
And then we also need to realize that if we keep account of our blessings, that also gives us patience. When we see other people in distress and we see our own selves in those particular areas to be blessed by the Almighty, when we see a person who is blind or half blind, and when we see our own eyes, we have this, this tremendous uh, feeling of gratitude. And this gratitude actually gives us this patience also that how we have been blessed and how at times we become jittery if we are not blessed with a few things while at the same time we enjoy so many favors and blessings of the Almighty. So patience is the name, is, is the, is the name of an attitude of life. It's, an, it's the name of resigning to the will of God while at the same time doing our best and always looking to be positive. Patience creates positivity and if we are patient we always think and we always interpret something which might not be very pleasant in a positive way and we think of the future. So with these few words, uh, we come to an end to this session. Remember, patience is something which, is, which holds the key to wisdom as well. Patience is something which holds the key to the mysteries of life as well, to keep account of God's blessings, to keep the account of how people are in various spots of bother, all of these things make us closer to God. And at one place the Almighty says, Oma sabruka illa billahi, that you cannot exercise patience unless you have a strong relationship with the Almighty. So to become patient individuals, we must have a very strong connection with God. That strong God connection is the only thing which can make us patient and resign to the will of God, while at the same time, becoming positive and not pessimistic, while at the same time indulging in life, contributing uh, to what we can in various affairs of life and not just resigning ourselves to fate. So thank you very much, uh, viewers, uh, for your uh, attention and participation, inshallah. We, we'll meet each other uh, next week, uh, same time. And until then, it is Khuda Hafiz.